disaster in the uh, in Uttarakhand. And I'm sure the thematic session will pick up many more topics to deal with. This presentation was given to the Indian Planning Commission. I've reduced it slightly to fit into the time given. But if you'll allow me to do that, I think it's easy to say that the Himalayans are prone to disasters. But let's just unpack that word disaster. If a flood comes and nobody is living there, no loss of life or damage, in a way it's not really a disaster, right? It's somehow the fact that people are there, people are managing, that make it a disaster. It's this, so it's this interplay between people and the environment, really, that's behind uh, many of these disasters. So if we look at some of the characteristics of uh, some statistics about disasters, it is a place, and, and when I talk the region, it's our eight different countries at Isimo, but we have about 76 disasters in a year, about 36,000 people are killed, and over a million people are affected somehow by disasters every year. So it is quite something we have to pay attention to. About a third of these disasters are from floods, and you'll immediately recognize uh, this from the, the recent Uttarakhand. But it's also flooding that crosses borders, so transboundary issues, the mountains and the rivers coming from the mountains, typically cross uh, several national boundaries. So it's something we have to work together to deal with. Let me just uh, emphasize that there are many different kinds of floods, and each one of them has a little bit different remedy or different things to think about. And two broad kinds of flooding are the big riverine floods, where the rivers swell up and overtop their banks, versus more flash floods. And uh, these are caused uh, from up in the hills from a rapid rainfall, uh, from glacier lake outbursts, from cloud bursts that give an intense rainfall. Also, it's something we don't think about too much of these landslide dam outburst floods. So these are actually quite common. We hear a lot about blobs. It's actually a lot of times that landslides come down and block the river <clears throat> the dam reaches and it causes intense flooding. But each of we need to think differently about these two different kinds of floodings. So if we think again about water-related disasters, and this is a striking graph that shows that in Asia, when we get a flood, indeed many, many people, a large percentage of the population is, is killed. Uh, and the second graph is showing that that's especially true in flash floods, as opposed to the big river island floods. So the blue line is telling us the mortality in flash floods is quite high. So it's something we have to pay attention to, these flash floods as well. An important point are that these floods are very often transboundary floods, especially the big river island floods, but not only that, but many of the flash floods as well, and I'll get into that. Uh, so, what we have to do is work together across borders to deal with these flooding issues. Right now, the situation is that there's a lack of exchange of real-time data. <clears throat> we could be doing better with it. That uh, we're not, there's different countries have different skill base. India is quite, has a quite strong skill base in floods. That's not true of all the countries in the region. Uh, we have some bilateral agreements and some treaties, but probably need more of those. And there is a, a door open for much more regional cooperation in floods. If we look at this statistic on the left side, it says uh, about nine, say about 10% of the floods are transboundary in nature. But if you look at the third column over at displaced, what it's telling us that over 60% of the, where people get displaced happens in these transboundary floods. By the way, one key message to give is that uh, the casualties, the loss of life and damage really does not need to occur if we can manage this much better. And what I'd like to do is get into that. And I think it's something we really need to, to uh, focus on. It's not a matter of fate to where we're unlucky with climate change and cloud bursts. It's really how people manage the situation that can, can really relieve the situation much better. Let me give an example between China and India. This is the year 2000. This was one of those landslide floods that actually
actually blocked the river, and then when the dam got overtopped, there was a huge flood that came down the Yarlan Tungu, or the Brahmaputra River. Uh, it caused uh, extensive damage, but no casualties in China, basically probably less people living there, but heavy casualties in India, over 30 people dead, many, many homeless, millions of dollars of rupees worth of damage. The happy news is that people did something about it. In 2002, there was a data sharing agreement between India and China, uh, and in 2004, a similar event happened where the Parichu River in Tibet was blocked. Huge volume of water came down, but the Chinese communicated that event with their Indian counterparts. And uh, 56 villages along the river were at risk. The dam broke out in 2005. There was a big damage again of property, but there were no human casualties. So somehow people responded, did something about it across borders. So very, very important uh, lesson to be learned there. Another flood in recent years is the Koshi Barrage. Now one way, it used to be in the past, one thing people did with floods is wouldn't build your house so close to the river. Also build your house on stilts, right? So when the flood comes, basically you're up high. What we've done in modern times is decided that the dikes are the way to go with floods. And, and they, if well maintained and managed, it's an effective measure. People get relaxed, they get a sense that things are okay if you have those dikes. But believe me, if we don't really maintain and repair dikes, even in a simple river, and I mean, this was not a tremendously high water event, we had huge floods, and the, the diagram on the left, it's hard to see, the river is here, the dike burst, and the whole river was diverted across the floodplain, causing tremendous damage. But the me message here, better maintenance, better planning, Perhaps even better ways of thinking through flooding could really make a difference. So some of the lessons from the previous floods are we do have huge data gaps. We're missing those communication systems, those flood systems that could really help us out. We can do better in flood infrastructure and planning. And there is a need for transboundary cooperation to deal with many of these flood events. So what do we do? What are some of the challenges and solution? The first is to immediately fill some data gaps. Now what this is showing on the bottom is the elevation, right? So at low elevation, that's the tall red graph, we have plenty of data stations. But when we get higher and higher up in the mountains, three to four kilometers, four to five kilometers, five to six kilometers, two weather stations, six to seven kilometers, 6,000 to 7,000 meters, zero, a lot of the rainfall happens up high. We don't know what's happening up in the mountains. Right? We don't have that information. We need to get weather stations up high in the mountains. And it's more difficult in that mountainous terrain really to, to uh, tell what's happening in the weather. There are some high-tech solutions. Satellites can do some of this. I think there's huge improvements in the satellite technology for rainfall that can be made. Uh, to make up for the lack of data station. We still need the data stations to calibrate those. This is, uh, if we look back, right, at the satellite estimations, what happened in Uttarakhand, the dark blue up near Kedarna says that the satellite was showing us that there was a lot of rain, there was a very intense rainfall. The issue is we didn't use that information to uh, give more information downstream. We can also put modeling to use, very high-tech modeling to use in a better way for flood events as well. But one of, one of the other movements that's happened across the globe are these regional flood information systems and the uh, World Meteorological Society is behind this. There is one for the HKH, the Himalayan Hindu Kush region, that we can take better advantage of, where we can share information across borders. And um, there is the HKH Hypos, and, and right now several countries, and India is uh, an observer to this operation, is trying to set up an end-to-end -end system where we can share data and get that data moving across borders faster than floods is the motto there. We can draw lessons. The Mekong region is also an area where many countries have a stake, and here, uh, Countries like Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, and 
and China have agreed to share data with their weather stations across countries. And that's been quite a positive story that can be replicated better in this region. Basically, what we need to set up is, is more of an end-to-end -end system that goes right up to how much rain is falling, snow is falling, when, it, when the flood is coming, a forecasting system that crosses uh, boundaries, a response system to disseminating that information down to stakeholders. This, is, this would be the kind of the dream to develop this, but definitely a possibility. Now I've talked a lot about the higher end high tech systems. Oftentimes that doesn't help us for the real localized flash floods. And there there's a different kind of solution and we can employ in fact some almost homemade gadgets to help us out. And so this picture is something of a, a device that simply detects the water level in a stream when the water level goes up, it sends off a signal to an alarm, beep, 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 beep. It can also send signals to a phone, telephone system, and lives can be saved with this type of system. We're trying this out in many places, including uh, in Assam. Uh, this requires really strong interaction with communities, right? That, that requires that the communities own this. They're trained to, to use this type of system so that they don't have to wait for complicated systems often relying on somebody far away. So this is something we also need hand in hand to go for. By the way, working with communities, um, if we think about the migration and think about men moving out of villages, we better be paying attention to the women and making sure they're also prepared for floods uh, as well. That may be a key stakeholder when thinking about flood information system, but plenty of scope for cooperative action in villages working with communities to do something about this system. This is just a newspaper clipping from Assam. We're, we're testing some of these uh, systems, appreciating uh, these uh, very localized flood early warning systems. At Isimo, this is a picture of our building. We have a big satellite system, and which is uh, <clears throat> good for other things, <clears throat> excuse me, forest fires and snowfall. And we're testing out ways of getting messages to cell phones as well. So I think it's this mix of high-tech, low-tech government systems as well as very community-level approach that's going to see us through. This uh, photo, I'll show this twice, is taken in 1921. Uh, this is on the Tibetan Plateau. And a, a more recent photo taken by David Brashears shows dramatically the melting of glaciers and the formation of these glacial lakes. Let me do that again. What you have to do is keep your eye on one place where you see a glacier in that photo, and you can see the tremendous uh, loss in mass in that glacier and the formation of these glacier lakes. And what's happening is these are forming. We have hundreds of these, over a thousand of these forming, getting bigger all the time in this region. And this is a, a diagram of the Koshi River. About 40% of the Koshi River Basin is in the Tibetan Plateau in China. It goes through Nepal, mostly in that yellow, and then down into the Indian Plains. The yellow dots, hard to see, are many of those glacier lakes, really putting people in hydropower stations, and there are many hydropower stations built. We have to think more how we're, kind of rethink these hydropower, if we're doing that, we definitely have to take into consideration the threats from these flaws. Also, a transboundary approach is very much needed. And in 1985, there was a, a block that came down from the head, just bowled right through those steep river valleys in Nepal, totally wiped out a hydropower station. And it's almost if you go back there to the same place today, it's as if people forgot. That didn't happen. You know, it's been long. We forgot about it. <laughs> we learned our lesson. Uh, but I can say that more hydropower companies are taking that into consideration. But also when you go in those steep river valleys, you notice people are building in those same valleys where a lot happened 20 years ago. People are building houses right on the river. My gosh, if you want a disaster, that's exactly the recipe for that. Also, it, I was amazed that people would build schools right down on the floodplain of the river because that's the place where land was available. And it really is heartbreaking. It's almost, gosh, I remember a few years ago, it turned
turns out more different people are moving into the communities, but it's how we plan and build our infrastructure that is putting together the recipe for disaster. It's something definitely to talk about. So what I'd like to do is to conclude with a few points. It is possible to build these kind of end-to-end -end systems. Uh, I think it, it's, uh, it is possible, and what we need to do is definitely link science with government and communities together. We could do much better with our infrastructure planning and management, and that has to be very mountain-specific. We don't have blocks in the plains. And we can do, come a long way with transboundary information system and really do much better in cooperation. So again, the message is there are, there are floods and there